Hello, this is the FCI podcast. I'm Attila Martin, and in this episode, we cover the topic of the illegal puppy trade in the European Union. But if you are from any other part of the world, feel free to join us, as I'm sure in this discussion uh, will be helpful for everyone, even outside the EU. The problems and the solution may be different, but you will find similar patterns and valuable ideas, especially regarding the solution. And my guest today is Julie Sanders. Her connection to animal welfare started a long time ago. She first volunteered in the animal welfare sector for 10 years as a trustee and welfare officer for site hunt rescue organizations. She is the founder of an animal welfare organization in Ireland focused on improving the welfare of racing greyhounds. She achieved a BSc degree in animal behavioral science and welfare at the University of Greenwich, achieving first class honors. Julie was appointed country director of Four Poles International in the UK in 2013. And since 2015, she has been the international director of Companion Animals Department at Four Poles. In her current role, she is responsible for the strategic direction of the department, including creating compelling international campaigns to advance companion animal welfare, overseeing the operation of Four Poles stray animal care programs worldwide and managing the team of 50 veterinarian staff, campaigners, and animal welfare specialists worldwide. She has always loved animals, especially dogs, and her family includes a rescued Saluki, a rescued Whippet, and two Italian Greyhounds. And let's start with the basic term. What is illegal puppy trade and why is it illegal? Uh, first of all, thank you for the lovely introduction, uh, Attila. <laughs> um, okay, the illegal puppy trade is something that, um, Four Paws has been focusing on for many years. It is, um, when we talk about Europe, it is where puppies are bred on puppy farms, mass production of puppies, um, and primarily in Eastern Europe, and then they are sent over illegally to Western Europe for sale. So that's it at its most simplest, but as we go through our discussion, I think it'll be very clear you know, the, the, all the detail behind the, the puppy trade. Uh, I think also an understanding that, you know, the conditions in which these puppies are bred are, are really poor. Um, and um, the fact that they are separated from their mothers very early um, and then transported hundreds of miles often without food or water. We also hear of some puppies being sedated. They're brought over to Western Europe and then they're either sold direct um, or they're sold on by puppy dealers uh, to other uh, dealers um, in the country, uh, their destination country. Um, and then usually they're advertised online. So primarily we they're advertised on classified ad sites because you can reach a large audience and, and also you can stay anonymous, um, but also uh, they are advertised on Facebook site, closed Facebook sites, Instagram. Um, so these are the main channels to market. Um, in terms of why it's illegal, well, it's illegal on so many different levels. Um, I think first, if we look at the breeding, it's illegal because uh, the conditions in which those animals are bred, also the conditions for the breeding dogs. I think often we, we talk about the puppies, but people forget the actual breeding dogs and how they're kept. These contravene in a lot of countries animal welfare legislation. Um, in terms of uh, transportation, for example, um, the transportation contravenes a number of EU travel regulations. So um, a lot of the puppies come through on the um, EU uh, pet travel scheme, and that's pet travel scheme. It's not commercial travel scheme, which is why it's illegal. The puppies come through um, at, at too early an age to be transported. So we've seen puppies coming over <clears throat> as young as sort of uh, four weeks. I mean, it's quite shocking um, when, you know, the puppy shouldn't be transported until they're at least 15 weeks. Um, we see puppies that haven't had the right vaccinations because they must have uh, rabies vaccinations. They haven't had the right uh, worming treatment or haven't had any worming treatment. Um, we see the conditions in which those animals are transported, um, often, as I said, without food, without water, uh, they're crammed into the back of car boots, um, so it really is quite shocking. Um, in terms of selling, um, I think that the two main areas, one is uh, that um, the uh, 
puppy dealers want to avoid regulation, they want to avoid taxation, they don't want to be seen as commercial dealers, although they're bringing over, you know, hundreds of and sometimes thousands of animals into Western Europe. Uh, so uh, they use classified ad sites to um, advertise anonymously, and they might open multiple accounts um, so that, you know, they can they can sell different breeds, uh, but they pose as private sellers and not um, commercial uh, sellers. So they're not regulated, they're not taxed. Uh, so that in itself is illegal. Uh, so you see that there's a, a huge number of uh, things that uh, make this an illegal trade. And I think, you know, no one should be under any doubt that how sophisticated it this is in some cases how many networks there are involved, unscrupulous uh, breeders, vets, transporters, puppy dealers. Uh, in some cases, it's a whole international uh, network comparable with the drug trade, for example. Um, and you know, and now, th thankfully, even the EU is recognising it as organised crime. So, um, yeah, really important that it is recognised as that. And it it sounds to be a really well built up and well-operating network for me. I don't know that how much of this can be detected because, because okay, uh, illegal illegal trafficking with, with, with drugs, puppies, guns or whatever, it is, it is under the radar, but, but uh, it sounds that, that we know how it works, how it builds up um, and, and all these details which are important to, to really understand the mechanism behind this whole system. Am I right? Yeah, it, it, but because there are so many different areas, breeding, transporting, selling, and because it's cross-border, it's extremely complex. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to know at, at what point you tackle tackle it. And actually, it needs tackling at every level, and it needs a very sort of joined up and a holistic approach to tackling it. It also needs um, cross-border cooperation and sharing of information between different authorities, and, and that doesn't always happen. Um, and people don't think of the puppy trade as being, you know, such a big thing. But it, take an example, um, we had um, one car that was stopped. It was actually a, a dealer who had both drugs and puppies in his car. Uh, the drugs had a street value of £10,000 and the puppies had a, had a value of £15,000. Now, for the drugs, it was far more risky for him to be transporting those. Um, and, you know, it, had he got caught, he'd have a very severe custodial sentence. But for the puppies, no, often these puppies, you know, they, they get through. Uh, there aren't very high penalties, uh, you know, very rarely custodial sentences. So you can see why it's attractive um, in terms terms of you know operating with puppies as opposed to for example to drugs this is why it's so important that it's really seriously recognized as organized crime and addressed at that level yeah and it's a huge amount of money because because dogs are getting more and more popular and if the and, and if we are talking about popularity let's talk about a bit about the effect of of the last one and a half two years uh, I mean the pandemic situation because because uh, the demand for for dogs started to rise dramatically, drastically, and and okay, there will be other problems. We now know that many people when, when they start to get back to their previ previous life, let's say so, uh, it causes troubles. But it also has probably a very huge impact on 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 the rise of illegal puppy trade. If I'm right. Yep, yeah, it, it definitely has. We've seen a significant rise in people wanting puppies during lockdown, during home working. And of course, that demand's been there. But at the same time, it has been challenging for the puppy dealers because we've had these lockdown situations where sort of non-essential travel has not been allowed. So things like people picking up puppies, etc. However, you know, th th these guys are extremely sophisticated, I say guys, could be girls, are extremely sophisticated in terms of, um, you know, uh, moving the puppies over to Western Europe um, and actually selling those puppies. So, you know, certain things we've seen is, is the moving sometimes from during this period from classified ad sites to closed Facebook pages. Uh, they've been able to get the puppies there because the demand has been so high and because the prices have been so high. I mean, we've seen some breeds actually affect fetching 100% more than they fetched pre-pandemic times. So you can see there's even more of an attraction there for, for people to get puppies um, across um, to other, to, to Western Europe. 
Okay, and uh, I think it is it is it is unquestionable why it is bad from the aspect of, of of the society, of course, because because it is not good for the society as well, but for the health of the puppies, because just to just to separate a four week old puppy from from the litter, it it causes a lot of health problem, behavioral problems, etc. So uh, you mentioned that there are more different stages of this this whole whole uh, phenomenon. And, and if we, we divide this into separate parts, let's start with, with, with breeding. If we call this breeding at all, because I know that, that the people who are registered breeders, people who take care about the, 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 the dogs at home, uh, the litters of puppies, uh, it is a bit offensive for them to be called, uh, this, this illegal puppy farmers to be called as, as breeders, but this is the general use of the world. So, so let's talk about, about this part, the, the produce and the, the reproduction of, of the illegal puppy farms and, and after the transport. What can we do to, to, to tackle this kind of problem? Yeah, it's very uh, difficult because, uh, you know, a lot of breeders are not known to the authorities. So I think, um, you know, that there is a piece of legislation that has come in, uh, EU legislation, which is the animal health law, which is uh, requiring that all uh, sellers, breeders and uh, transporters of um, dogs and cats are registered with their uh, with the their competent authority in the in their country. Uh, this is really really important because it actually provides. Um, a database where we can actually check information, we can check addresses, we can check names uh, and, and make sure that those sellers are traceable. Traceability is, is the really hardest part in terms of finding the breeders, finding the sellers. So having this registration, I think is key. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about the online trade and you know how, um, how we'll use that in the future, but certainly having that piece of legislation is really important. In terms of the animals themselves, you know, it's not just important to track the sellers, but also the animals and uh, have traceability of those animals and their origin, because so many people, you know, for example, in the UK are buying um, puppies and not realizing that their puppies are actually from Eastern Europe. You know, <laughs> they're thinking they're, they're homebred, they're, they're buying them from a, what they think is the breeder. Um, so, you know, knowing the origin of your puppy is really important as well. And to help with that, um, having a mandatory INR, when I say INR, I mean pet microchipping. Um, and for those technical, I mean transponder, but we'll, we'll call it pet microchipping uh, because it's best known as that. So um, it's really important to have that uh, mandatory uh, pet microchipping and registration across the whole of the EU. Uh, and to have a harmonized system is really important too. To have uh, databases, uh, national uh, databases, pet microchip databases that are interconnected so that we can see, um, you know, especially this, the, the cross border nature nature of this uh, illegal trade. Um, and there are organizations out there like Europetnet, which a number of national databases feed into, feed their information into. Um, the whole point of Europetnet was originally so that if a pet went missing when you were traveling across Europe, you could go to Europetnet and you, you could find out, um, you know, if, it, if that pet had been reported, for example. But this type of database um, could also be used in terms of doing that checking if it holds all the records from uh, national databases around Europe. So, you know, there are potential solutions that we are in, we are really working on now uh, to make sure that there is traceability. Uh, that really is key. And I think, uh, okay, the the dog got produced, born because I, I I like to use this word produce because actually it is mass production in many cases, completely ignoring. Uh, even the basic uh, precautions to, to have healthy dogs, healthy and, and uh, with healthy, I mean physically and, and, in, and physically as well. And okay, they are produced, they are transported to, to the destination country. Uh, you talked about dealers, you talked about uh, putting them directly online. So what do we know about this part of the whole process? Well, uh, well, let me talk about the problems with with online. Um, I think if we talk about Instagram and Facebook, there are major problems here because it can't really be 
regulated or controlled unless they are able to, as I've said, verify sellers and verify animal details, which um, they're not doing. And it's the same with classified ad sites. With classified ad sites, you know, uh, these sellers remain anonymous. You know, usually they only have to give a name and um, an email account, for example. Uh, so, you know, they can re remain anonymous and they can just disappear if, if the sale, if, um, uh, somebody wants to uh, somebody has bought a puppy and the puppy's ill and tries to find that seller they can disappear uh, they can also open multiple accounts so we've seen um, for example um, one seller in uh, the Netherlands uh, when we were doing our investigation you're, you're only supposed to have one account to sell puppies he had 33 accounts um, and was selling 33 different types of breeds that were imported. Um, so you can see the scale, and of course, anyone buying a puppy from him didn't realize they would see him as a sort of private breeder. And of course, you know, he was avoiding taxation, avoiding regulation. So it's um, very easy for, um, you know, uh, sellers to be able to do, illegal sellers to be able to do this. Of course, some sites um, are, you know, um, trying to address this in terms of having uh, posting rules, uh, but posting rules are only really effective if people are checking them and the sites really um, are not putting the resources required to checking that the ads that are going up, you know, are um, not against the posting rules. And I'll give you an example, one really well known classified ad site that we've researched recently uh, in the UK, um, we looked at the ads and we found that over 40, uh, well, it was 47% of um, the animals on that site were imported. Now, according to the uh, rules of that site, it does not allow for imported animals to be sold, uh, imported puppies in particular. So here we are, all of these puppies were imported. Um, so that shows you the scale. So it's, it's kind of lip service to put up posting rules if at the end of the day, they're not checked. Um, some other sites are trying to put in verification, and that's great. And, and we're working with some really progressive pioneering sites who are looking at a system that we are creating uh, for verifying uh, sellers and uh, the animals being sold, their details. Um, but, you know, this is really what's required. Uh, the other problem with these sites is consumer protection because consumers aren't protected. And it's something that we are raising you know, lobbying about with the EU, uh, consumer protection is really important. Of course, animals are treated as property and as products, but they're sentient beings. So it's not as if you can return a 40 um, dog, when I say 40, with behavioural issues. But according to the law, you could, but you're not going to because that's your dog. That's your, you know, you have an emotional bond to that animal. And a lot of people are not aware anyway of, of the laws um, around, you know, what you can and you can't do. Um, regarding sale and return. So, so yeah, there's there's a huge number of issue around these sites. Um, and um, in terms of what we can actually do, well, we are working on a technical system at the moment uh, with Europetnet and other industry stakeholders that's called PetSafe. And the PetSafe system actually is a system that allows you to verify um, both the seller's details and the animal's details through the microchip. In the future, we also want to verify through these registration details, uh, so the seller through the registration details. Um, so, you know, this is why um, the animal health law on that piece of legislation is so important and why mandatory uh, pet microchipping um, across the whole of the EU is also important and why we need it. So, yeah, those are, are two of the ways in which we can address it, particularly online. Oh my God! I, I just a side note. It is it is obvious. It's really obvious that that uh, uh, we have a lot of issues in society related to 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 the online world. And I could we, we could talk about we won't because this is not our topic. But we could talk we could talk about online bullying, other other type type of frauds or whatever because we live a kind of parallel life online and you know me i'm not a geek but but i use all all all, all the tools of the online world but it, it seems now that this is the era where we have to find the weaknesses of using online tools which are related to to animal welfare problems and because because yeah 
Yeah, I, I, I think um, it's interesting because part of this this problem is making uh, the the digital advertising platforms more responsible for um, removing illegal content. And this is something that the EU is looking at at the moment through the Digital Service Act. So the Digital Service Act already exists in, in um, across uh, the EU member states, but it's being updated at the moment by the um, EU Commission. And, um, you know, the area, sort of three areas it's looking at. One is uh, making these platforms more responsible for removing illegal content, making them responsible for moving, mis removing misinformation, and also, you know, to have more transparency around um, advertising. Now, th there are no specific provisions for pets on this, but we are lobbying hard at the moment uh, to ask that as part of this act, what's included is that um, it's recognised there's an issue around the advertising of pets and that we have um, the sellers, ver the sellers and the animals being sold verified. So we're, we are trying to lobby for that as part of the Digital Service Act. Uh, that for us is extremely important. And also, you know, we're not just talking about animal welfare, we're talking about animal health and we're talking about consumer protection to very important areas uh, for the EU in particular. And you, as you mentioned uh, consumers, let's talk about them a bit because it is yes. a general, 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 general concept that if there is no demand, there is no market. And okay, you mentioned that, that uh, uh, there are fake profiles, people can't verify, but I think it is a huge problem that people uh, don't really have a clear concept knowledge or they just don't care how they pick up the new dog. And it is a huge problem from my, from my perspective. Yeah, well, they should care because um, apart from the animal welfare issues, there are a number of personal risks to themselves. Um, there is a risk in terms of health. Um, the animals that come across, um, because of the way in which they've been bred, they may have, uh, they maybe ha have diseases, zoonotic diseases, for example, which, um, you know, travel from the animal to humans. Uh, they may have uh, diseases that go to other animals. So parvovirus is a very common disease amongst puppies on puppy farms, and that's, you know, uh, fatal for um, other uh, pets. So these type of um, sort of medical problems they have to consider because they will impact them. They also might have a dog that they bought that has um, genetic disorders or that is sick and that's going to be high veterinary costs. Uh, they may have uh, a lot of these puppies they're brought up in barren environments, there's no interaction, there's no socialization, so they might have behavioral problems in the future. Again this this may be a cost for them. So on the health alone you know there, there are some big issues. Um, the financial side as I said there, are, there could be a number of costs um, implicated with this um, in the future. Um, also, um, you know, there are also risks um, around. Oh, sorry, that's my no doorbell problem. ringing. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, th there's also risk that they receive falsified uh, passports, um, pet passports, vaccination details. Uh, they're not really aware of the origin of their dog, which is a problem as well. So there are a lot of uh, personal problems. There might be the you know, emotional side where they might actually have a very sick animal. Uh, that animal may die. Uh, so, that, you know, when you bring that um puppy into a family you know it's really distressing we, we've spoken to you know uh, families that have lost their puppy and how distressing it is for them so there are a lot of issues um, involved personal issues uh, that people should think about um, and you know impulse purchasing is really a, a massive issue because um, it's very easy to impulse purchase online and, and we're all buying online now and that's been reinforced with COVID uh, because that's been our really our, our only uh, channel to buy. Um, but, you know, puppies shouldn't be bought quickly. People really should do their research. First of all, they should uh, really think about is this the right time to get a puppy? Are we set up for a puppy? Uh, because a puppy is for life. It's not, you know, an animal that you have just in the short term or just during lockdown. In fact, we, we were saying a puppy is for lockdown because this is what a lot of people have been doing, buying puppies during lockdown. And what we're seeing is a lot of puppies actually going up and being resold, uh, which is really sad. You know, puppies from sort of, um, well, anything from three months to 12 months where people have bought them during the height of the pandemic and have now decided that they're reselling them. I think, interestingly enough, they've 
bought them also at the height in terms of prices. So they're trying to resell them at very high prices. But, you know, there's so many puppies being bred now that the, the, I don't think the prices are as high as they were a little while ago. So, um, so yeah, so you really need to think uh, very carefully if you're going to buy a puppy, you know, is it the right time? breed am I buying the right breed you know is it the right breed to match my lifestyle if you're buying a pedigree dog um, it's no good buying a husky if you live in a, a, a very small flat and you don't like exercise it's the wrong breed for you um, so you know these are really important considerations and I would say, you know, find, uh, do your research on finding the right breeder because um, it, it's well worth waiting for a well socialized, healthy puppy as opposed to just, you know, getting an instant puppy online. Um, you know, do all your research on three levels. So, yeah, really important. Yeah, I think it is, it is, it, it, it is, it is, it is crucial in the solution because, okay, when I, when I shop online, for example, and I see a book which gets me really excited and I, oh, okay, let's, let's buy it because it is, it is about something I really want to, to, to read or it covers a topic I really miss. And, but it's not the case with dogs. And, and it's, I, I think it's a really huge problem that, that, oh, I like this dog based on the picture. And maybe the breed is completely uh, won't fit into my my environment, my lifestyle, my temperament. But okay, I buy this one. This is this is uh, available immediately. Maybe I I compare prices on different sites. But come on, you are not shopping a book. You are uh, shopping a new family member, a dog, which would probably live for 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 more than ten years. And and this is something that the society really should learn. And because you mentioned breeds, uh, are they are they certain breeds which are are really popular in in illegal puppy trading? Yeah, I mean the, the uh, breeders and the dealers are you know um, will obviously breed according to the demand. So depending on particular trends, fashion trends, example for example, they will breed according to that. And it would, depends on different countries, but there are generally some really popular breeds at the moment. So French Bulldogs, Dash Hounds, Pomeranians, um, English Bulldogs, Chow Chows. I mean, these certainly for the UK, these are the key breeds that we're finding, but, but they'll adapt. I mean, if a breed becomes popular, then it will be bred um, because they are breeding to demand. So, um, but yes, I mean, there, there, there are a whole range of breeds, but I would say certainly for the UK, those tend to be the more popular breeds that we're seeing and those are the most sort of popular fashion trendy breeds at the moment as well yeah because if there is a demand uh there is always a market behind because because yes. you, you you produce what you can sell and exactly. especially on the highest price and and if we are talking about the solution you you already mentioned that that the eu started to 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 consider this as a serious topic to handle how you also already mentioned the 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 animal health law which came into to life recently so so what can we know about about the strategic approach of the eu to the legal environment that, that uh, will we have a new system a new solution in the following years okay you don't have a crystal ball but what but, <laughs> but you can you can you can you can, you can, you can um, predict the 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 whole procedure <laughs> No, I, you know, I, I really think both uh, the EU Parliament and the EU Commission are taking this far more seriously. Um, as I said, it was recognised this year as organised crime um, by the EU. Um, and, you know, it doesn't just have implications for animal uh, welfare. It has implications for animal um, health, for consumer protection. So it's really important. Also, um, you know, many EU citizens have shown that they're really concerned concerned about the mistreatment of companion animals, particularly uh, through the online trade. Um, and, you know, that's been shown in surveys that have been conducted by the EU. Uh, so, you know, that there's a real important reason. And, and as I've said, because it's organised crime, it needs to be taken seriously. Also, there was a sort of landmark milestone in uh, 2020, um, where there was, uh, where the um, MEPs uh, put a motion for a resolution for calling on the EU to take action basically around the addressing the illegal puppy trade and so they asked for the EU uh, Commission to put in number to put in place a number of things including an action plan for addressing the illegal puppy trade particularly 
online. Uh, they also ask for higher penalties. And I mean, that's key because you know the penalties aren't high enough. As I say, often we don't have a custodial, uh, custodial sentence and, and that's really important uh, longer term as well. Um, they also wanted better training for customs and, and better joining up of customs and veterinary authorities. So the, there'll be the sharing of information. They want more people to consider adoption. So, and, and that's really important as obviously <laughs> from my organization organization's point of view but I think people often don't think about adoption when it comes to puppies but you know there are lots of younger dogs in shelters in rescues who also you know need desperately need homes and a lot of the um, animals that are in shelters are in there you know through no fault of their own they're in there because somebody's gone and and um, impulse purchased online and have, has decided no that wasn't the right decision and they may have handed those over to the shelter or worse still abandoned that animal so, you know, that the animals are there, um, a lot of the animals are there through no fault of their own. So I really would recommend people think about adopting as well and, and have a look at, you know, uh, the animals that your local shelter has uh, for adoption. Really important. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the, the basic thinking of many animal welfare organizations and registered breeders who, who really want to get rid of all not, not all of them, but the, the majority of, of the dog welfare problems or to reduce them, because I think that problems will never disappear, but you can reduce the number. I think everyone says that, that, that if you want a new dog, either buy from a registered breeder with, with, with the pedigree and, and all the, the trackable parts of, of, of the dog, or go to a shelter to adopt the dog. Uh, but don't buy from a puppy farmer or, or from the internet or whatever for this, this kind of reasons. So I have no, I, I, I truly agree with, with that. And I think that that registered responsible breeding could never uh, uh, produce, it is, it is not the best word here, could never, never produce uh, uh, and, and meet the requirements of the society related to dogs in numbers, because, because it is really trending to, to have a dog at home as a pet. And, and uh, there are not that many uh, responsible registered breeders who could, who could, who could meet up to this, this, this requirement. And if we are talking, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, Sorry, I'm uh, just gonna say, and that's a big issue because we've got this gap. Um, yeah where there aren't enough um, professional, responsible, reputable breeders. Um, and this gap is being filled by the illegal um, puppy trade, by, by these uh, illegal breeders or these uh, unscrupulous breeders. Uh, and there is the problem. And, you know, so encouraging um, what, one people to adopt and two people to, you know, really uh, go into professional breeding where, you know, the, they put the welfare of the animals at the heart of breeding uh, is really key, really important. And, and if, if we are talking about, about uh, professional and responsible breeding, uh, what is, what is your, your opinion about, uh, about the activity of registered breeders? Let's call, call registered breeders those, those, those guys and girls who, who operate under the, the FCI, for example. Uh, do they have any kind of responsibility or can they help to, 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 to change the situation of illegal puppy trade? Because uh, for, for, for them, it is, a, it is a very sensitive issue if they, if they think through how things are connected to each other. Because in, in case, for example, I, I breed huskies, you mentioned huskies, I take all precautions, I take all the, the DNA tests, everything, I plan my, my litters, I, I, I cost a lot of money, energy, effort to, to have really healthy puppies just to, just to uh, go on with this breed. And in case this, this breed got popular and, and uh, the whole Western Europe will be full of, of genetically unhealthy uh, huskies, after a while, people will say that, oh, these are the breeders. And, and the registered breeders are visible. Compared to, to the illegal uh, puppy farmers, registered breeders has been visible, visible for a while because they, are they have a registered kennel name. It is compulsory to, to, not to microchip, but you have to have an identification for each of your dogs. 
et cetera, et cetera. And for the breeders within the FCI, it is really, really annoying to, to, to hear all the blames, which, which really, really goes, should go to the, the irresponsible puppy farmers, breeders, backyard breeders, whatever we talk about. So what, is, what, what could be, uh, obviously the solution, but how could breeders do something with this? What do you think about this? You know, I can really understand the frustration when you're, uh, you know, a professional breeder who is doing everything right, who cares passionately about your breed, the welfare of your animals. So I can understand the frustration. What I would say is that um, both the FCI and kennel clubs uh, need to be, you know, spokespeople for doing the right thing. So educating the public in terms of how to responsibly and safely uh, buy uh, puppies is it's key uh, and playing a, a really important role in doing that. I also think I hear from a lot of people that buy online a lot of uh, puppy buyers and they say well I, I don't know you know how to find a good breeder how do I find a good breeder and and that is a major problem because um, you know and this is why people end up online because they think they can just go onto a classified ad site and it's a breeder I think what we have to do is uh, or at least the FCI and kennel clubs need to do is show what is a good breeder to the public and show how to find a good breeder of course we need more good breeders absolutely there's a shortage um, and that is an issue in itself um, but you know there, there are um, you know good breeders out there so we must connect you know responsible buyers to responsible breeders uh, and make sure that people don't end up just going online buying on impulse not checking who they're buying from or asking the right questions um, I also think that you know they, they need to uh, you know really uh, give uh, people the tools so that they can check when they're buying a puppy what are the questions we need to ask you know what do we need to look for um, that's really important too and that's something you know we're doing a lot of we're actually um, have um, a campaign running from 2022 onwards uh, in February 2022, where we're going to be specifically targeting puppy buyers and really showing them the personal risk to themselves if they uh, buy from the illegal trade and giving them the sort of information and tools they need to uh, identify who is a good breeder. And, and uh, you know to find good breeders I think that's key that's what we need to do um, I also think um, the FCI and the kennel clubs need to lobby they need to lobby their government so that there is better legislation in terms of uh, breeding and selling of um, companion animals in particular I would ask that we would appreciate the support in terms of you know lobbying for verification of sellers that is so important because you know, most of the time these sellers, as you just said, are anonymous. And so you feel that the, the breeders in the kennel clubs get the blame. So, you know, let's not allow them to be anonymous. Let's, you know, have proper traceability and verification of sellers. And I'm sure if we did have proper verification um, and, you know, proper registration, then, um, you know, the, the, the trade would greatly reduce, I think. So, um, so those things are key. Communication is key, I think, in, in case of anything. And it is good you mentioned that you are planning a campaign soon uh, yes. <laughs> to, to, to target, to target uh, the buyers. Because as we agreed before, that, that to do something with impulsive purchase is, is, is actually a key point to do that. Do you, think, do you think that you can change the mentality of, of people who are addicted to, to, to impulsive purchase? Because, okay, this is the way I, I buy all the stuff in my life on Instagram, on Facebook, on, on, okay, we can't buy anything on Twitter, but I don't know if it has any connection to illegal puppy trade. Do you think that you can rewire this, this, this behavior of, of the modern human in the Western world that I want something immediately, I want to make decisions immediately, I don't want to weigh, I want to get the best deal. Do you think we can change it and how can we change it? Yeah, it's, it's always hard to change human behavior and it takes time but I think how we're trying to do it with our campaign is really focus on the personal cost so we're not going out with so much the cruelty although of course it is part of our campaign it's about the personal cost to you if you do this so if you instantly purchase you might think you're getting a bargain for instance a low cost 
pedigree dog, but actually it could cost you a lot more in the long run because you may have high veterinary bills. Uh, you know, if you purchase a dog from the illegal trade, you may find yourself with a dog that has genetic disorders. You may have a dog that has parvovirus and passes it on to your other pets. You know, you may have a dog that dies. So there are very personal costs to you um, that I think would people would think twice about and would think, well, hang on a minute, is it worth me doing this or should I go you know uh, the route of looking for a, a, a reputable professional breeder and taking my time and if you do take your time you are rewarded because you, you know you get a professional breeder the dog that you get should be um, well bred you know the breeder would have done the right testing the right breeding um, so um, so, yeah, I would really um, recommend that people, you know, see the value in waiting and not impulse purchasing and that breeders themselves, you know, show that value. Um, and if they have people that want uh, puppies, that they actually, you know, take them on a journey, that that they, you know, share the, the photos of the puppy as it grows up before it is actually uh, passed on to the new owner, that they really keep the people engaged because the journey is really special and really important. I'm actually going through the journey at the moment because um, I I'm, I'm, uh, have a puppy coming in uh, <laughs> in seven weeks time. So uh, it's, it's, an, it's oh. a, a nice thing to do. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. I, I'm sure it is exciting. I, I, when I, I just, just recall memories with friends who ask for help to, to, to find a good puppy, to get prepared for the puppy. And the journey itself, as you said, it is the excitement, waiting and everything also adds extra values. And it is necessary to, to have this special feeling, to, to feel and to have the attitude that it is not an, a new object, a new accessory for my flat or my house. Uh, it, is, it is something that I, I am waiting for to, to arrive. And, and also, I think people often underestimate, you know, that, that a puppy will come into their life, it'll fit to their lifestyle. No, <laughs> a puppy is a baby, you know, it, look, it needs looking after, you know, similar to a baby, you know, you can't just leave a puppy, you know, and, uh, you, you know, go out, you, you've got to look after a puppy, you have to socialize the puppy, you know, you have to, there's so many things you have to do to take care of a puppy. It is a huge commitment. And it's not a commitment that lasts a couple of weeks, you know, puppies are, are are young you know for 12 months you know you really got to uh focus on that puppy and be dedicated to that puppy um and to teaching that puppy the right things during that period um and this is why we find so many puppies uh young dogs as well are going up online to be resold because it was all a nice idea you know oh, we're going to have a puppy but once we get the puppy and it starts to grow up and it's not as cute and we realize we have to walk the puppy every day you know and you know there's a number of the puppies chew my shoes and and <laughs> because it's teething you know those, those things become less attractive and and if people have just instantly purchased they've not done the research they've not understood what to expect what to do and and that's why it's really important to take your time yeah it is it is i was just thinking about listening to you that it is it is another topic but it's an interesting topic that that people we don't think about the commitments it takes to to have up uh, a dog properly because i i often hear that just because because uh, dogs are said to be really fantastic creatures completely adopt into the human environment they think that okay the new puppy arrives to me and it immediately knows everything like like your smartphone with all application installed no the dogs are eager to 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 learn from you to learn how to behave in your society how not your society in the society but at home as well but you have to to take courage it is not enough to to upload very cute and funny pictures to instagram because this is not having a dog responsibly there are a lot of lot of things to do so we have a lot of topics i think to talk about related to responsible uh dog keeping uh because dogs yeah. are complex creatures and going and back as humans are <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know the two together so and, and we've been together thousands of years and and, and that's the yeah. beauty of it but um but you still have to you know learn to communicate with your 
puppy, teach your puppy, uh, you know, basic commands, uh, give your puppy a routine so it understands, you know, your puppy understands what to expect. There are so many things involved with having a puppy. It's not just having a cute puppy, as you say. Um, and, you know, I really want people to think about the long term commitment. You know, as you said, it's 15 years, 16 years, maybe even longer. And, you know, a, a puppies are there like children for, for, for that time. And, you know, you can't just sell a puppy on. I, and I read some awful ads on classified ad sites where it says we're downsizing. So the puppy has to, well, not the puppy, but the dog has to go. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> downsizing. So the dog has to go. OK. <laughs> you know, there's just some really, really irresponsible uh, people out there. And, uh, you know, in terms of how they see their their uh, pet and uh, yeah it's very sad yeah it's not an object you you buy just because you like it as we talked about it and just going back to to the topic of, of the illegal uh, trade itself uh four Post has a document uh aiming uh this problem i mean the illegal puppy trade uh it, it's called tracing the trade uh could you could you could you talk about it a bit it is i i read this it is a very good thorough uh document targeting uh, all the different areas we, we, we talked about and it, it shows who those stakeholders are in the solution. But just could you give us some, some teaser for those teaser. ones? <laughs> yeah, teaser. What, what will people get if they, they read the document? We will put the link into the description of, of the video and the podcast as well. Oh, well, yeah, it's, um, it's about our model solution for solving uh, the illegal puppy trade. And, you know, it, it is uh, primarily based, as I said, it's, it's on traceability and making sure that um, all stakeholders in a, a dog's life or a cat's life are traceable um, and the animal itself is traceable. Um, and it's about the verification of sellers online and our pet safe system. So it explains the whole process and why, you know, having this type of system will really benefit um, animal welfare, will benefit companion animal welfare, um, and in particular will help to reduce the illegal puppy trade. So um, yeah, that's my teaser. <laughs> Okay, uh, because I think I'm sure it is useful for 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 many organizations or people involved in the topic or interested in the topic to see the real solution. Because okay, I think anyone related to dog health and welfare they, they perfectly know that okay, it is a problem, but it is it is much bigger and and much more complex than we first think. If you are not involved in the topic that deep, and and. Yeah. And, and for the solution, it is important to, to target all the different parts and, and to, to act together, to, to cooperate mutually, because one thing will not solve the whole problem at all, I think. Not at all. I mean, you need a multifaceted approach because this is so complex. It's on so many different levels from, you know, breeding, transporting, uh, selling. Um, so, um, you know, at every level you need to look at different approaches. It needs to be joined up um, so that there's a really holistic approach to addressing it. And um, yeah, I, I hope that, you know, we, we've kind of covered that in, in the work that we're doing and also in the lobbying of the EU to, you know, really um, look for a holistic approach um, and work you know with all the EU member states both the supply countries and the, the buying countries and and you know have a, a solution that really um, will address or bring an end to the illegal puppy trade I mean it has to be brought to an end and I think now that it's recognized as all organized crime I hope that you know it's been treated serious enough that uh, the different stakeholders will work together to have this multifaceted solution. I'm sure it is, it is obvious for everyone that this is a matter which has many, many negative effects, huge effects, but, but it, is, it is obvious that, that the, the biggest losers are, are the few puppies uh, because it is a huge animal health and welfare matter. And I do hope that we could manage to, to give a deep insight about the nature of the, of the matter and what the solution is. So I do thank you for joining this episode and, and giving me this kind of information and your ideas and opinions. Uh, it, it, was really, it, it was really good. Really good. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Attila. Thanks. Mm -hmm.